Let me extend uh, my welcome on behalf of the uh, College of Law uh, and the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and Environment uh, to our audience today. Uh, that includes uh, uh, those folks uh, who are here uh, in the moot courtroom uh, with us, as well as uh, several hundred uh, uh, folks uh, who are joining us uh, virtually for today's presentation on political extremism uh, on uh, the public lands. Uh, I'm Bob Kiter. I've had the pleasure of uh, directing the Wallace Stegner Center for just about 30 years now. Uh, and uh, we've uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to uh, present uh, these uh, noon uh, programs uh, that we refer to as uh, green bag programs. Um, let me begin uh, with our uh, acknowledgement uh, of uh, native lands. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, in the, uh, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government. And we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to per a partnership with native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Uh, a couple notes on uh, uh, impending uh, future events. I think uh, they're noted uh, on the uh, screen behind me, but March 14th and 15th, the Stegner Center will host our 29th uh, annual uh, symposium on transitioning to renewable energy, how to build a bright future. Uh, this uh, addresses obviously the transition to a carbon neutral uh, energy system and the related sustainability, environmental and human health uh, concerns uh, that are wrapped up uh, in that uh, transition process. Um, and it, uh, I should note that registration is open uh, for the symposium. Uh, you can register on uh, the Stegner Center website and uh, the uh, early registration uh, fee is reduced uh, through the 5th of uh, March. Uh, so take advantage of that if you're considering joining us for the symposium. Um, April 10th, uh, at this time uh, in uh, the moot courtroom, we'll host a green bag on Wallace Stegner's uh, unsettled country, uh, ruin, realism, and possibility in the American West. Uh, this is uh, connected to a book uh, edited by uh, three uh, Western, uh, I should add, esteemed Western historians, uh, Mark Fiji. Uh, at Montana State University, who holds the Wallace Stegner Chair in uh, History uh, there. Uh, Liesl Carr Childress, uh, who's an Associate Professor at Colorado State University. Uh, and uh, Professor Michael Lansing, uh, also a History Professor at Augsburg University in Minneapolis. Uh, there are a number of uh, accomplished uh, academics and others who contributed chapters to uh, the book. Uh, so please join us. It takes a hard-edged uh, look at Wallace Stegner and uh, his legacy. Uh, in a matter of uh, shameless self-promotion, uh, yours truly has a chapter in the book that connects uh, uh, Wallace Stegner's uh, 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 book, uh, Marks of uh, Human, excuse me, this is Dinosaur and his opening essay, Marks of Human Passage, uh, with the uh, designation of the Bears Ears uh, National Monument. Okay, uh, so today uh, we'll address uh, the topic of political extremism on public lands uh, through the vehicle of a panel discussion. Uh, we have three uh, distinguished individuals uh, to uh, provide us uh, insights into this issue, which has been prominent in the American West for some time now. Let me introduce first uh, the moderator for today's uh, program sitting in the middle uh, on the stage. Uh, that's uh, United States Magistrate Judge uh, Jared Bennett. Uh, that's Magistrate Judge in the District of Utah. Uh, 
Uh, Jared's a graduate of uh, this law school, uh, also holds a master's degree in public administration from the University of Utah. Uh, he clerked on the Utah Court of Appeals uh, before um, entering uh, the, solicitor, uh, the solicitor office uh, honors program for attorneys at the Department of the Interior. Uh, not long after that, he transitioned uh, to uh, the uh, United States uh, Attorney's Office here in Utah, first as an assistant United States attorney, then as a first assistant United States attorney. And uh, finally, uh, beginning in uh, uh, 2020, uh, he has served as United States Magistrate uh, Judge for the District of Utah. Uh, he's uh, joined uh, on the panel uh, by uh, the uh, individual who appointed him a first uh, uh, assistant uh, United States attorney. Uh, that's a former U.S. attorney for Utah, John Huber, uh, who is a, an accomplished uh, litigator uh, who's literally tried hundreds of civil and criminal cases. Uh, John served uh, from 2015 to 2021 as the United States Attorney for uh, the state of uh, Utah, having been appointed initially by President Obama, confirmed unanimously by the Senate, and then reappointed by President Trump, and again confirmed uh, unanimously by uh, the United States uh, Senate. Uh, he's currently in uh, private practice as a shareholder at the Green Greenberg uh, Trout Rig Law Firm. Uh, and then we are also joined uh, by Kate uh, Gretzinger, uh, who's the communications manager for the Center for Western Priorities. Uh, before assuming uh, that position, uh, she spent two years uh, covering uh, Southern Utah uh, for KUER, the public radio station here at uh, the university. Uh, and uh, her coverage included uh, uh, the Bears Ears National Monument and other uh, hot button uh, public land issues uh, in that part uh, of our state. Uh, as I mentioned, she's currently with the Center for Western <clears throat> uh, Priorities, uh, where she hosts a, a podcast uh, known as uh, The Landscape uh, that uh, <clears throat> addresses uh, some of these uh, same issues. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to turn uh, this over to uh, Judge Bennett. Uh, to address the topic of the day, political extremism on public lands. And thank, let me thank the three of you for joining us and being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kider. It's a privilege to be back here at home and especially to be with you, a marvelous professor who has inspired generations of lawyers to go out and practice uh, in this very field. Today, I wanna to talk with you and we want to talk today about political extremism. Now, in our polarized world, sometimes the word extremism gets thrown around because subjectively, we may think that someone else's view may be extreme. My goodness, I mean, if you watch the, the, the news, we have polarized news outlets that if someone sneezes, then someone's going to criticize whether it was a conservative sneeze or a liberal sneeze, and whether it was extreme. We're not here to talk about subjective views of extremism today. The way we're going to be defining extremism for purposes of our discussion is when strongly held beliefs cause an individual to break the law. So we're going to be dealing with cases that talk about the breaking of the law, whether civil or criminal, mostly we'll be focusing on criminal law violations today, but not based on some sort of negligence or some sort of recklessness, but rather a volitional act motivated by beliefs that crosses the line into the criminal or sometimes civil arenas. There are many examples of this over time. We can go back a really long ways, but we're gonna start with what my kids would call ancient history, and that is the 1990s. In the 1990s, we see some very interesting political as well as land, uh, public lands motivated movements. Well, what we would associate typically with the left we see a lot of people during, uh, during this time where we have clear cutting of forests, we have the, the spotted owl controversy coming to the fore, chaining themselves to trees, climbing up into trees to stop this clear cutting that had been authorized by the United States Forest Service. On the other hand, what we would associate with the right, we see folks that are having a movement to say, don't pay your grazing fees anymore. 
because the federal government can't own the land on which you're paying them. In fact, you should pay any grazing fees to the county. And we see people whose cattle were found in trespass and were impounded in some of the armed conflict that resulted even back then. Fast forward into the early 2000s. On the left, we have examples like Tim DeChristopher, an, oiling, uh, an activist who uh, decided to go to a BLM oil and gas uh, lease sale where he began to bid illegally on the oil and gas parcels that were offered and stepped over the line by committing a crime, which we can talk about today. And in fact, Mr. Huber was the prosecutor um, at that time uh, on that very case. On the other side, for example, in just closer to home, in 2005, we have some folks that were going out and improving, in their words, some recreational activity, some recreational trails in Recapture Canyon in near, near uh, Blanding, Utah, and San Juan County. Recapture Canyon, if you're not familiar with that, has been stated by some as kind of a mini Mesa Verde. There are cliff dwellings, there are other uh, remarkable archaeological finds from ancient Native American peoples in that area. And they helped build a road, which was uh, also something that was prosecuted. Fast forward a few years. On the one hand, back to recapture, we have a protest ride that was led by one of the county commissioners at the time. And numerous people drove up the canyon in terms of protesting BLM's closure of that canyon for archaeological reasons. On the other side, we have examples of Earth Liberation Front or an Animal Liberation Front that are uh, causing damage to property on public land in order to stop a pheasant hunt. Fast forward to the 2020s. On the one hand, for example, in Portland, Oregon, we have uh, race, racial protests that result in significant damage to the federal courthouse. In fact, it was almost set on fire. And on, of course, January 6, 2021, folks that are unhappy with the result of the election decide to kick in the door of the, of the nation's capital and raise a ruckus. Over time, we see one common theme. That, these, that the political theory that these folks have results in the actual volitional criminal behavior. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna start with the kind of theoretical underpinnings of each side's view to the extent that, and, and obviously this is gonna be an overgeneralization at times because it's hard to speak specifically about individuals or necessarily specific groups. But speaking in generalities, we're going to talk about those intellectual underpinnings that lead to this behavior, as well as what happens and what should happen when this behavior manifests itself. So let's start with Kate, who has uh, an extensive on the ground experience. Um, help us understand a little bit more about what we would associate with right side politics and this and the theoretical underpinnings that have led to some of these uh, criminal violations. Sure. Um, so I guess I'll just start by saying I my on the ground experience includes living in Waco, Texas, <laughs> and um, Blanding, Utah, two places I pretty randomly ended up, didn't plan on that, but it's coming in handy today. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the beginning of the Sagebrush Rebellion, which is sort of a, a loosely um, defined leaderless movement um, that exists in the American West, specifically related to public lands. Um, I'm going to start by reading this quote from former Colorado Governor Richard Lamb because I think it sums up the Sagebrush Rebellion very nicely. He called it a, and this is a quote from 1982, he called it a murky fusion of idealism and greed that may not be heroic, nor righteous, nor even intelligent. Only one certainty exists, that, sagebrush, that the Sagebrush Rebellion is a revolt against federal authority, and that its taproot grows very deep in the century's history. Beyond this, it is incoherent part hypocrisy, part demagoguery, partly the honest anger of honest people. It's a movement of confusion and hysteria and terrifyingly destructive potential. What it is, no one fully understands, and what it will do, no one can tell. And I'm sure he didn't foresee the Bundy um, standoff at Bunkerville when he said that, but um, the Sagebrush Rebellion has sort of, it, it like this quote alluded to, it's kind of existed as long as the federal government has been involved in managing um, grazing rights on federal land. So um, it really, it's real sort of um, 
genesis um, goes way back to maybe the Taylor Grazing Act in the 30s, which was when the federal government came in and said, no, actually, you can't graze your cows wherever you want, um, started to impose a little structure on federal grazing. And then really it flared up in the late 70s in response to the Federal Land um, Management Policy Act, um, which kind of shifted the BLM from just uh, being an agency that facilitates grazing to be an, being an agency that manages public lands for the benefit of all Americans. Um, and, and we've seen it sort of flare up during um, democratic president, pre, uh, presidential administrations. Um, it's sort of a, it's often a, um, a reactive movement rather than a proactive movement. Um, and feel free to cut me off. I could keep going. But basically, we, we've seen sort of three um, big flares of the Sagebrush Rebellion, um, once in the 70s in response to FLIPMA, in the 90s in response to Clinton and some of the um, policies that Jared mentioned, and then also um, a more modern movement in response to President Obama and um, things like the bears, the designation of Bears Ears and Grand Staircase, well, Grand Staircase by Clinton. Um, and I guess I'll tie this all together by saying um, most of the, the right-wing active or extremism that we'll talk about today um, is connected to the Sagebrush Rebellion, either loosely or, or um, directly in the case of Phil Lyman, who's um, uncle, I believe, was Cal Black. Um, somehow, some familial relation. Everyone in Southern Utah is actually related. I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, but <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there, there's direct familial connections, and then there's just sort of the invocation of the Sagebrush Rebellion um, by a lot of these actors on the right, and I will leave it with that. Thank you very much for, for offering that background. Now, John, in, in your experiences, you, you prosecuted Tim to Christopher, and that was uh, one of the more remarkable cases, I think, just by the publicity that it generated. We had stars from Hollywood flying in. We had stages and songs. I mean, it, it was one of the more remarkable trials uh, that we've had in the District of Utah for a while. What did you learn in the as you were dealing with that particular case, investigating it and prosecuting it, about maybe some of the what we'd associate with left uh, political leanings and extremism. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Uh, so that was a it was quite a spectacle that case, and I, I don't know how you measure in the history of Utah, but for the federal court, just the the circus like atmosphere around the trial, um, the great public attention, uh, the packed galleries of, of people, parades from Library Square to the federal courthouse, the aftermath of of people of uh, being arrested for sitting in front of the tracks train and blocking it, chaining themselves to the federal courthouse doors. It was quite a spectacle. Uh, but kind of going back to what you asked about the underpinnings, um, you know, having deeply held philosophical or political beliefs is not a problem. Uh, this is the richness of our country to have differing opinions. I think what I hope to talk about today and what we talk to talk about is when that, when that deeply held philosophy drives you to crossing the line, exiting the lawful area into this area which should be a safe harbor for us to exchange ideas, and then imposing your viewpoint on another because you want to and it's not their choice. So with Tim to Christopher and that kind of that genealogy of uh, inspiration for unlawful protests, one, one incident we didn't talk about when I was in high school, 1980s, uh, the Burr Trail and the paving of the Burr Trail and vandalism that was inspired, it, we believe, by this um, protect the environment motivation and, and damaging construction equipment to the tune of you know, $50,000, $60,000 in 1986 money. That train of acting out on your philosophy to impose your view on another outside the boundaries of the law. That, that's what I would call extreme. Violating the law is what I would call extreme. And so in the situation with Tim DeChristopher, he was an undergraduate student at the university at that time, went down, um, signed some papers, entered the auction, and then won uh, about $1.8 million worth of leases. Um, it was, uh, and it drew attention that day, it was a very hot item, and as Kate mentioned, some of these emotions that 
then turn into unlawful behavior do go with who's in power politically in our nation. And that was at the tail end of George Bush, uh, George W. Bush. Uh, there was this feeling that we have to do something, and that was the motivation for going in and violating the, the law and rules of that auction. Um, it turned into quite a spectacle. It turned into quite a drama. I mean, there's a lot to talk about there. One thing that became important was I think the defense really wanted to make this a trial about climate change and that that was the necessity that drove Tim to Christopher to commit the unlawful acts. Um, we made a motion to the judge that that's not an appropriate this isn't a venue for that. You should limit the evidence and the judge agreed so that it was just whether he violated the statutes uh, in the U.S. Code. Um, but you know, he took on a role of, of, of civil disobedience. Uh, it really changed his life, probably in a positive way. He became quite of a celebrity afterward, uh, had a lot of positive attention to him. He had a lot of support at the trial. Um, his defense attorney, one of the more prominent defense attorneys in the history of Utah, a very effective advocate, compared him to Rosa Parks and, and then a line of Gandhi, Brigham Young, and even mentioned Jesus. Uh, and the argument didn't go well for for him. And uh, the judge, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, Judge Benson, you know, imprisoned him at the end of that. I'd love to hop in really quickly um, with a little nuance on this definition of extremism that we're using. Um, I'd like to point out that often the extremists um, on the left are protesting a government that they do see as legitimate. Um, and that's actually different than the right and a lot of the folks involved in the Bundy's dealings. Um, they actually don't view the federal government as legitimate. Um, and they espouse these really sort of fringe ideas of posse comitatus, which is this idea that the um, county government is the highest form of legitimate government in the United States. Um, the Bundys all carry something called the Scousing Constitution, which is the Constitution plus um, some, I haven't read it, so I can't tell you exactly what it says, but um, clauses that basically say um, the, the, um, uh, the, Founding fathers never intended the federal government to have any power over the people, um, and so they they espouse these really bizarre ideas that are that are not part of our legal system. Um, so I think that when we think about political extremism, um, it's important to remember that the folks on the left are generally um, protesting, Ill often illegally, um, a government that they see as legitimate, and they are intentionally breaking the law to prove a point. Whereas on the right. They are um, going about their their lives as what they would call um, so sovereign citizens, um, and and therefore, like the Bundys, don't believe they're even breaking the law by not paying grazing fees. They think that the law is illegitimate. So I just wanted to inject that. Yeah, so one that's that's a little inconsistent with my experience when it comes to right wing, because I think there are some sovereign citizens that kind of have married those concepts of. There's no federal government. I've been kidnapped into a foreign jurisdiction. I see them with relative frequency in federal court. <laughs> They're interesting. Um, and some of the, the, the ideas they, they, they espouse, but some of the, the right-wing extremists in terms of land use, I think see the government as legitimate. What they see is the government is overreaching. And so while the government may, it's not the sovereign citizen, the federal government doesn't exist and I'm zip code exempt type people, although there are those, there are a lot that say, look, this is just an overreaching government. It needs to stop and it, it shouldn't be doing all that it's doing in this administrative state. John, do you see it that way as well? Yeah, I think so. It's hard to apply a one size fits all on either side of this issue. There are different flavors and types and motivations. And I think people we would call being on the conservative end of this, uh, many of them are law-abiding people otherwise in their life. They hold public office, they hold law enforcement positions, um, uh, but this has become such an issue for them that they've lost patience. And this is, this is an issue that I, that I don't like in their philosophy, and it's not upheld by the law, that because I'm impatient with the political process or bringing in a civil suit to be uh, handled by, you know, like we resolve problems and, and disagreements civilly, 
um, the grassroots, the persuading, the lawful protests, they've kind of checked off that we're not going to go there because we're too impatient and we're just going to cross the line of the law and impose our will on others. Um, I, you know, I think it's very different between Bundy's taking over a wildlife refuge and having a standoff with the federal government for weeks up in Oregon. That's a very, very dangerous conduct. And one person, a Utahn, uh, died at the hands of, uh, you know, pulling a gun out and with the FBI there and he died and the funeral was held in Kanab, Utah. And uh, that's a very dangerous situation compared to a protest ride that is unlawful, but is misdemeanor level conduct and otherwise peaceful. Let's talk about that impatience for a moment, because I think that was the impetus behind the recapture Canyon ride. And at least the, and I think also the precursor to that, which you prosecuted, which was the, the improvement is the, the local, the two individuals from, from Blanding went out and, and improved in their words, the, the, uh, the ATV trails that were in recapture Canyon. I, I, why do you think that impatience leads to action as opposed to filing it in court and, and going about it during in the legal process? What do you think? creates that jump in time in their minds. It's a surprisingly well-developed area of the law. There are a lot of circuit court opinions on protest cases. Surprisingly, many of them, many of the lead cases come from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is not generally revered as a bastion of conservatism. And yet they make clear that you're lazy. You broke the law because you're lazy. And they list off, you know, half a dozen things that you could have done in lieu of breaking the law. And uh, that's really how the law views these people who decide that I'm going to exit the lawful bounds that everyone wants to abide by, and I'm going to exert my opinion on someone else, whether that's at a BLM auction or down in Recapture Canyon. Uh, that's what they're doing. They're ignoring the persistence required to change the state of the law and just jumping to unlawful behavior. Kate would be interested to, to hear your take on that. Sure. Um, so kind of going back to what you said, yeah, I definitely don't want to paint everyone on the right as a um, delusional, you know, anti-government, um, non-government believer. I think there's a, a real spectrum there. I think Phil Lyman is actually a great um, figure to look at when we talk, when we, when we think about sort of the spectrum of, of anti-federal government um, activism here in Utah. Um, the recapture ride that that um shoot i don't have my timeline up but i think it occurred in 2014. um phil lyman who was a county commissioner at the time in san juan county um was a leader of that ride however it it was sort of um co-opted by the bundys and ryan bundy specifically who came over to san juan county to and brought um, a lot of his followers and phil lyman um actually didn't want to go and break the law. He, he recognized the closure and he um, sort of begrudgingly was bullied into participating and leading this ride by the Bundys at a pre-ride rally um, where Phil, got, Phil was sort of saying, you know, um, he was just kind of trying to make a, a, a little noise about it, I guess. He wasn't trying to get arrested. Um, but the Bundys said, you know, if you mean this, like if you mean business, then we gotta go break the law. Um, and, um, they did. And, um, I'll note again that Ryan Bundy actually, after the Malheur, um, occupation, uh, claimed himself as a sovereign citizen. So he has these ideals that the laws just don't apply to him. Um, Phil, Phil Lyman is now a state legislator. He is in charge of making our state laws, ironically. Um, and he's also in his day job, a federal tax preparer. He works for H and R block. He, that so, sovereign citizens don't work for H and R Block, um, so there's definitely a spectrum here. Um, but but they all do espouse sort of a, the similar ideology that the federal government should not be involved in telling us what to do. Sh maybe shouldn't even exist. Um, I don't think Phil would go so far as to say that. Um, but yeah, there, there's a spectrum. They're not all operating from a complete um, reckless abandon. One of the interesting things about some of these prosecutions of some of these bigger cases, for example, uh, one of our one of our uh, viewers is talking about what can law enforcement do concerning Clive and Bundy and his cows, and why has this not been done? So let's let's compare what happened with Clive and Bundy 
the case that went to prosecution, but Judge Navarro in Nevada dismissed it for uh, for basically Brady violations that she found in the Ninth Circuit upheld for not disclosing evidence timely to the defense from the prosecution. And then we have Malheur where we have a jury that acquits everybody that was prosecuted there. John, as a former United States attorney, what flaws did you see in the prosecutions of both of those major fel felony events that resulted in nobody being held accountable for those? Yeah, it was it was very frustrating from the law enforcement side because if you take the Bundy standoff in Nevada, you had people on the freeway overpass with high-powered rifles with scopes on them pointed at federal agents and officers. And but for, you know, uh, some luck and some providence, it could have been just a really ugly affair. And then uh, I've already talked about uh, the repeat of that up in Oregon. Uh, very frustrating. I think it, it gets into maybe a side issue that doesn't really talk about what we're doing today. But you have so much evidence and almost you drown in evidence uh, with all of the uh, everyone's cell phone. Uh, all the things posted on the internet. Um, it was just an overwhelming case to bring. It wasn't just as simple, did they point a gun at the agent or did they unlawfully take over the, the wildlife refuge? And I think that caused problems. So we think of the federal government as having unending resources. And sometimes it feels like that when you're a charged person. And I'm on the other side of that now. And I can see that perspective clearly when I represent individuals and companies. But they really don't. And I think the prosecution teams became overwhelmed and made some serious errors, certainly in the Nevada case, serious errors. Uh, they put on their best case they could up in Oregon. But look, when you, when you call a federal jury, it is not just the Portland audience you're calling them from. It is the entire state of Oregon, and it's the entire state of Utah. It's the entire, entire state of Nevada. And so you have a little bit of a disproportionality in the number of people who come from the rural areas of those state compared to the urban areas of those state. And these are issues that divide our country. When you think that Nevada has, what, what percentage? 85%. 85% federal land. Utah is second at 66% of federal land. And most of that impact comes on rural communities. This is a big issue. And so, the jurors who are impaneled, like in Oregon, I'm talking, they they have a perspective that this impacts their life. And I, I have to think that became part of their deliberations. I'd okay. love, yeah, I'd love to just hop in and um, go off of that and talk about the the Bunkerville standoff and sort of the, the implications of the lack of prosecutions. Um, uh, so, so at the Bundy Ranch, um, you may or may not be familiar with this group called the Oath Keepers, but um, they, let me get my timeline, I believe they started in 2009. Oops. It's kind of hard to do this without two hands. Um, okay, well, we'll just skip the timeline. Um, so the Oath Keepers started as this loose sort of like, like paramilitary like group of former law enforcement and former military um, folks who are who pledged to uphold the Constitution and, and fight tyranny of the federal government over the people. Um, Stuart Rhodes is the founder of that group, and he was at Bunkerville at the Bundy Ranch standoff. Um, and he, of course, was also at the January 6th insurrection. Um, and I do believe that if we had seen prosecutions in the Bundy Ranch case. I'm um, sorry, I should go back and mention there were many, many milit militia organizations that were involved at the Bundy Ranch standoff, many of whom were also at January 6th, not only the Oath Keepers, also the Three Percenters, um, Bundy's own um, People's Rights Network, I believe, um, has around 30,000 people in it of, as, as of the last count a few years ago. Um, they also were involved in January 6th. And um, I do believe that the, the Bundy Ranch standoff emboldened these people to um, take up arms against the federal government. I think that, you know, no one knows what would have happened if, if things, if history had played out differently. But um, uh, there was involvement in January 6th, especially by Stuart Rhodes. And, and we do see that he actually was finally prosecuted in 2023, yeah, last year. Um, and 
you know, that, that movement has lost a lot of steam following January 6th. Um, they, the, the federal government is taking that prosecution very seriously, um, and I think it is scaring a lot of these people um, who were form formerly emboldened by that lack of prosecution. Let's talk about, on that prosecutorial line, we have a question from our audience that says, how do courts typically view consequences of acts of protests? For example, the recapture ride, which only fell to misdemeanor charges, but some at some point, to large environmental impacts on the land, do those impacts influence courts? So John, as a former prosecutor, courts aren't the, pe they're, they're, not the they're not the charging body in our, in our accusatory justice system. We simply play the role of referee. How do those charging decisions get made, and how, how does that so how does that deal in terms of executive power, deciding how that charge is made, as well as interfacing at least in the federal system with the grand jury? Well, there's a concept called prosecutorial discretion. Uh, we can't file every single case that comes across our desk, and certainly at the federal level, it's you're selecting what cases to bring as opposed to if you're a county prosecutor, you really have to review and bring many more cases because you're the principal responsible person to enforce the law. But at the federal level, when you select what kind of cases you wanna bring, that's it, you're, you're pretty selective. Uh, but surprise, surprise, prosecutors are humans just like you, Americans just like you. And uh, we read the paper, we're concerned about similar issues, mostly we're concerned about the law and enforcing it. And then it comes down to, is this case worth our time to consider? What is the evidence that we have? And what is the law? And can we, do we have a reasonable expectation of success at trial if we believe there's a federal interest to pursue in this case? So when someone interrupts uh, a federally authorized uh, BLM auction and you know, causes a lot of damage uh, in mon monetarily, that's something that we decide we'll go forward on. Um, what about, and, but then we read the papers. And if you go back in time and read about, you know, Tribune making strong statements about what's fair is fair. And um, once uh, President Obama came into office, uh, then the pendulum swung. And now the, the right wing people who care about these issues, they become more vocal and more active and get involved. And they start doing things that appear to cross the line. Uh, but an example of that, okay, what's next? You, should, you need to be equal in your application of the law. You just did this big Tim to Christopher case, this big circus of a case. You need to look at everybody. Well, shortly after that, we had a protest ride like the Recapture Canyon ride, the Pariah out of Perea, I'm not sure how you say it, Pariah River uh, protest ride down in uh, Kane County. Very similar setup, county commissioner, state legislature, pre-ride rally, BLM saying, don't do it, uh, you know, we're enforcing the law. And there was uh, hundreds of people who rode up the riverbed uh, to, to protest, much like they did in Recapture Canyon, but we didn't bring a case. And I was the prosecutor who led that investigation, but it's because we couldn't. The evidence didn't come, the law didn't match. And when you have counter protesters from the left leaning side of these issues, who themselves rode up the canyon on motorized vehicles to a point that was within the boundary of, of what was being protected. And you have mixed messages uh, of enforcement, not enforcement by the BLM. Uh, it just became a case that we couldn't prosecute, even though we read the papers, we're concerned about issues, and we want to apply the law evenly. That wasn't a case that we could bring. And in our prosecutorial discretion, but also ethical obligation, you can't bring a case unless you have a reasonable expectation of success. That was one we had to take a pass on. But, you know, history tells us there's a lot more cases that warranted our, our scrutiny and our attention. So I think uh, it is, is, and I appreciate that answer, Obviously, prosecutors have to look at the law. That's the that's the place you start. What are the elements of the offense, and what's the what's the evidence we have to either prove or not prove those elements? But in addition to that, the Department of Justice and the public is free to look at this in the Justice Manual. There are there are principles of federal prosecution. What what are the values that a federal prosecutor has to take into account when deciding whether to file charges? In addition to that, there's a federal grand jury. There is a group of people that meet to determine whether there's probable cause to indict somebody if it's a felony case, and sometimes with uh, more, higher misdemeanor cases. 
But this is, it's a process that requires sifting through a great deal of evidence. Uh, and so those are the guides, I think, of determining whether there is going to be success, likelihood of success on the merits uh, after looking at all the evidence and, um, and the factors of federal prosecution. So uh, we're getting close to the end. Is that right, Bob? We're up, was it one? Okay, all right. Just wanted to make sure. All right, so um, when we, from the, from the kind of on the ground perspective, Kate, as we're talking about these prosecutorial decisions and your experience as a journalist, what are some of the things that you heard from in, in your interactions with, with uh, elected officials and the public about some of these prosecutorial decisions that were made, whether to or not to prosecute certain actions? So that's a good question. Um, I started my, I guess I'll call it service, in San Juan County in 2019, which was after a lot of these cases had taken place. Um, but I'll use this opportunity to talk a little bit about how folks in San Juan County, because that's my on the ground experience, um, think about the federal government and I think why they are so frustrated with the federal government. Um, they really see the federal government as um, as being very paternalistic and, and um, it's, it's important to really remember that like these communities are surrounded by federal land. Um, you and I, if we live here in Salt Lake City, are surrounded by city and then county, um, there's multiple layers of government that we can kind of go through to address our, um, our frustrations. Um, and the folks who live in San Juan County, you know, they kind of live and die by the whim of the federal government and who's in, who's in the White House. Um, that's a pretty frustrating position to be in when you feel disempowered. I mean, the BLM does, of course, take public comment on almost all of its actions, um, thanks to the National Environmental Policy Act. But if anyone in here has submitted a public comment during NEPA, um, it's not like you get a call back and they're like, hey, yeah, thanks for thanks for giving us your feedback. Here's how we're c considering it. No, you just kind of like submit your comment and you hope that they listen. But the federal government's going to do what they want to do at the end of the day. Um, and so I think that there's um, a real frustration with the federal government um, for that reason. And then um, in terms of prosecutions, um, I want to talk about the Blanding raid. Um, that happened in 2009. That was when the federal government um, planted an antiquities, an antiquities um, dealer in the community to gather evidence that folks in Blanding were raiding and looting um, ancestral Puebloan sites. And um, they gathered evidence for a few years, and then they brought in, the FBI brought in lots of officers, lots of SUVs. Blanding is a town of... 3,000 people, I think, maybe four. Um, and the the federal response, in my opinion, and many others, um, was just completely oversized. Um, it, it was reminiscent of what happened in Waco, honestly. Um, the federal government comes in with just tons of manpower. They've set these people up. Um, and it's it's um, it's overkill, quite, quite honestly. And um, that really puts a bad taste in these people's mouth. They don't see the federal government as being on their side. They don't see it as being fair. They see it as being paternalistic um, and um, really out to get them, honestly. Um, and I think that um, th that I'm trying to connect this back to your question. <laughs> um, there's there's a, just a big distrust of the federal government and um, we see that, you know, in the in the rejection in the um, opposition to bears ears and um, monuments today. They just, even though nothing on the ground changes um, when you create a monument, other than no more, no new mining claims or drilling leases, um, they just do not trust the federal government to manage the land in their best interests. And I think that that's um, a real shame and um, a real leads to a lot of opposition of land protection campaigns today. One of the things that I also think leads to this misunderstanding is a misunderstanding of what the law requires. And I think uh, some of our questions here, and I'm going to answer several of them at once, deal with why is it that, for example, Recapture Canyon results in physical damage, it's a misdemeanor, whereas Tim DeChristopher, it's more of a paper crime in the sense there wasn't physical land damage, it was a felony. Well, a lot of this is determined by, we talk about the federal government as if it were a monolithic whole. We have three branches of government. 
And the people that give us the law that has the executive branch then has to execute and the judiciary has to adjudicate comes from Congress. Sometimes the way Congress sets its priorities legally are very, they're, they're, they're not uniform. So for example, uh, under the Clean Air Act, if I have an air conditioning person come and work on my conditioner, he pokes a hole and purposely vents, uh, if I have an old air conditioner, free on gas into the air, according to Congress, that's a five-year felony. Now, it's a maximum of five. The chances of the maximum penalty being imposed are not good. But that's what Congress says. That is a felony, and it's worth five, up to five years imprisonment. Whereas if you have, uh, for example, somebody in a, in a coal mine, in a case I prosecuted many years ago, that violates some of the uh, orders from the Mining Safety and, and, and Health Act and, and the administration, if they violate those, and it may result in, in some catastrophic injuries, Congress has said that's a misdemeanor. That's the best you're going to get, a Class A misdemeanor. So in terms of recapture, the, the best that the, the facts would support is under FLIPMA, the Federal Land Policy Management Act, it's a Class A misdemeanor. That's what it was charged as. Whereas with FUGLERA, which is the, I don't even remember the, that's a big Hold act. on, that's the worst federal acronym I've ever heard. I agree. It's, I remember walking into your office, you were a civil attorney that day. And I was uh, investigating the DeChristopher case. I was like, what did this guy do wrong as far as what's the statute? And I went up to visit you, and you introduced me to that acronym. And I'm as puzzled now as I was then. Well, you won, so you apparently you weren't too <laughs> puzzled. But no, I mean, Fugler, I think it's the only Fugler of prosecution I've ever heard of in the United States. But it's, it was a felony. Congress made it that way. Which is, which is interesting. So sometimes the legislative priorities dictate how these things are going to be dealt with on the ground and in court because it's Congress that sets the law. Now, there obviously is prosecutorial discretion, but it's hard to ignore when Congress says this is, this is the crime, this is the penalty, misdemeanor or, or, or felony. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Congress made that choice for you. And as a judge, when you have to sentence, you may not be real comfortable with that. And you may wish it were different, but it is the it is the Article One branch of government that set that penalty, and you you do what the law requires because after all, that's what we're here talking about is the is 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 the uh, rule of law. You, you know, Jared, uh, looking at maybe the, going to the audience question, why is it so different? And that's the answer is what does the law allow you? And the Department of Justice has a policy that you pursue the most serious provable offense so the inclination is to go for as much as you can get that's the direction um, and so with Tim to Christopher's conduct that re those were felony level offenses because that's what the law prescribed uh, in the uh, Phil Lyman protest ride case uh, it was misdemeanor conduct at the at the end of that though the United States Department of Justice recommendation was very similar in those two in that we recommended to Judge Benson in the De Christopher case, give us a significant sentence to send a message that you don't cross the line to impose your beliefs on others. In the Phil Lyman case, we pre presented a similar argument. Judge Newfer, give us a significant sentence that will deter others from violating the law and imposing their viewpoint on others uh, by, by exiting the law. And resulted in jail time for both of those individuals. The judge heard us and agreed with us, but because of what the level of conduct was set by Congress, one was a two-year sentence and the other one was you know, weeks or months in jail. So, Kate, as we're talking about um, the, we've talked about kind of the prosecutorial legal end of this equation, how does the media affect the both the kind of the underlying beliefs that people might have as well as their reaction to what happens on the ground either from the the the, the criminal act itself or the way that it's handled by the executive or, or judiciary how, do, how does the media come into play here uh for these for these purposes sure that's an interesting question um so speaking again from my experience, uh, the Salt Lake Tribune is um, persona non grata in San Juan County. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the media, I would say, generally tries to report the truth. Um, they try to be unbiased, but as many of us know, there's no such thing as unbiased. <laughs> There's, there's bias in how you're choosing to cover the story, what stories you're choosing to cover. Um, 
and who you're talking to, there's just no way to keep bias out of your reporting. Um, and I um, would say that this sort of anti-federal government sentiment is, um, is uh, very closely aligned with this anti-national media sentiment. And of course, we saw President Trump fan those flames I came into San Juan County during Trump's final year in the Oval Office, and let me tell you, it was not a warm welcome. Um, people were, they, they didn't want to talk to me. They didn't believe that I, I would quote them correctly. Um, so I'm not sure. I would say that um, in a lot of these cases, the folks on the right at least um, perceive the media as being against them in standing alongside the federal government. Not sure if that answers your question. <laughs> well, it's, it's an inter it's interesting perspective. We've only been on the receiving end of a microphone, not the giving end in the media. So it's, uh, it's interesting to hear that perspective. One of the perspectives that our, our commentators, several have brought up, is the role that local and state government can play in maybe uh, – augmenting or or even fomenting some of these some of these uh, theories that we're talking about here. So I think back many years ago to House Bill 155. This was a time when the legitimacy of certain federal law enforcement agencies, specifically the Forest Service, the BLM Rangers, uh, many, many sheriffs in the state were questioning their ability to even enforce the law. Uh, at all, saying they're not law enforcement. So then we have a bill enacted, House Bill 155, which basically said that if the state law enforcement officials feel that the federal government law enforcement officials have exceeded the scope of their federal law enforcement authority, then those federal law enforcement agents would be subject to arrest and would be subject to felony prosecution in state court. John, you were you were around in the Department of Justice when that when that bill was passed, and, and the Department of Justice uh, reaction to it. Can you kind of help describe just historically what happened there, and then we can talk about any implications that are modern day from that experience. Well, look, it was a really troubling time uh, in federal law enforcement. We have very strong. We I'm not there anymore, but the federal government has very strong partnerships with state and local law enforcement agencies throughout the state. And as you might imagine, on 99% of the issues, they're totally aligned. Uh, illegal drugs coming into the state from Mexico, uh, violent crime committed in our cities, bank robberies. These are things that everyone agrees on and works very well as a team. But this issue that, that stems from these deep philosophical, philosophical, philosophical <laughs> beliefs, <laughs> close enough, um, it results in some some interesting outcomes. And so the Utah State Legislature passes a law on the recommendation of a segment of the Sheriff's Association that a BLM officer authorized by federal law, clearly authorized by federal law to wear a badge and carry a gun and enforce the law on public land or a Forest Service Ranger, same thing, the state law says we don't recognize them as law enforcement officers subjecting them to possible arrest in the field by a county sheriff's deputy for doing their job. For so they'd be charged with impersonating a law enforcement officer. This is, this is, this is scary to think that you're going to have a, what we call a blue on blue standoff or that someone uh, who's not law enforcement, but's carrying a gun. A lot of people carry guns says, hey, the law says you're not a law enforcement officer. I don't have to listen to you. In fact, get out of here. And you could see a lot of scary situations. So we did on the ground uh, advocacy with our partners where normally we're totally aligned to convince them this was a misguided uh, policy. But then we also went a step further and called Washington, which usually is not a great thing to do. Things get weird when you call Washington. But we had the civil division from the main justice uh, department come out and challenge that law in federal court. And it led to a federal judge, Judge Newfer, striking down that provision so that it was not uh, enforced. It, it, was, it never got off the ground, but this was state of Utah law uh, or was about to be. Can I pull a few threads here? Um, so it's gonna feel like I'm Charlie from, it's always sunny in Philadelphia, but all of these things are connected that we're talking about. And I'm gonna bring this back to the Sagebrush Rebellion and um, bring in the Constitutional Sheriff's Association, the 
um, county supremacy theory um, that is unconstitutional, and um, the land seizure movement, which is um, sort of born and bred here in Utah. So HB 155 passed um, in the Utah State Legislature in 2012. The Constitutional Sheriff's Association was founded in 2011 by a co-founder of the Oath Keepers. Um, and also in 2012, the state of Utah passed the Transfer of Public Lands Act, which required, well, demanded Congress turn over 31 million acres of public land in the state. I believe that's all of the public land, but maybe it's not, um, to the state government. So this is this idea called land transfer, land seizure, um, and it kind of st and it stems from the same place as HB 155, which is that um, the states and the counties are supreme over the federal government, and that the federal government does not have the right to own land. Um, and that's very much a sagebrush rebellion belief. Um, and so, all of these, um, and sorry, I should mention the Constitutional Sheriffs Association um, are, are a group of sheriffs, county sheriffs that believe that, well, they've sort of like taken an oath to uphold the Constitution regardless of what the federal government says. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to tie all of those together. It, it, and we really are all, it's all coming from the same sort of line of thought. It is an interesting line of thought because, the, uh, for example, the Utah Statehood Act contains a provision that a condition of becoming a state was that Utah relinquish all right, title, and interest, and that's a paraphrase, but it's pretty close, to all the unreserved federal public land. The state constitution to this day mimics that provision. The state of Utah hereby disclaims all right, title, and interest to unreserved federal public land. This was not a unique insertion into this Utah statehood bill. Almost every state... That came, that came about other than the 13 colonies and maybe Texas, that was purchased or acquired through, through, a, con through a, a conquest, had a similar provision in it. And even before the United States was a constitutional republic, so under the Articles of Confederation, that was still the law. So this notion that somehow we, th that the federal government relinquishes or is, a, it, it, it precedes the union. And one of the first acts of the first continental or the first con Congress under the Constitutional Republic was to reaffirm what had happened under the Articles of Confederation government, which is to say the federal government gets to keep its unreserved federal public land. And so how that I, I'm, I've just always been I've just never been I can't really figure that out, given the fact that it was expressly disclaimed and it predates the Republic. But that is what some still still espouse, and it's it's a mystery to me. John, you're about to say something about that. Well, I think going back to our, your preamble when we started our discussion, which is uh, it's not it's not extremism to have deep philosophies. Uh, it's not evil to not like the federal government or their policies. I mean, there'd be a long line in this room if we said, "Have you ever been angry at the federal government?" And and so this that's part of being American, I think. Uh, pledge allegiance and and then dislike the government. It's a it's a hobby for many of us. So I don't think we should even people who want to espouse beliefs or really want changes in the law, and it might sound crazy or kooky to us. I mean, we want to be careful because they have a right to those beliefs. The why I joined this panel is because I when you cross the line and you impose your will on someone else. That's not right. And I think that's what we want to talk about. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say, um, I think it, it is relevant to bring up the land seizure um, philosophy because it is espoused by Clive and Bundy. Um, it's why he thinks he doesn't have to pay grazing fees to the federal government because the federal government can't own land in his view. So I do think that when people do um, closely hold these really, um, these these sort of unconstitutional beliefs, um, it, it can lead to um, them breaking the law. So I, I think that brings us full circle here. We've, we've got a lot of different views about how our public land should be used. And that's great. That is, that is the beauty of the United States of America. We have the ability to influence our laws. We have the ability to help elect people that make those laws and, and, and how, how those laws are going to be enforced. 
But for us, in terms of what we're trying to, to talk about here today, is when we cross that line, and regardless of whatever deep-seated political or, or other resource views we might have, have them, talk about them, debate them, bring them into the public forum. Let's discuss them and see if they're worthy of adoption or not. But when we decide to cross the line, and I think as John has said so well, impose views, our views on others, without giving the process that we the people have agreed to, well, and sometimes you may not like the answer the process gives you. That's part of it. Losing is part of being part of a republic sometimes. But when we decide that it's, it's important for us to, we know better, either right or left, to impose our views on someone else and we cross the line of the law, we've crossed into the line of extremism, which is not good for the United States. It's not good for democracy. It's not good for the republic. And so trying to have this debate and know what those arguments are, know why or why we shouldn't uh, adopt them as policy is important to have that discussion. And I appreciate John and I appreciate Kate for helping us have that discussion today. And hopefully you receive something of benefit from this. Thank you for being here with us. Thanks, Professor Kider. <clears throat> Again, on behalf of the uh, Wallace Stegner Center and the College of Law, let me extend my thanks uh, uh, to John, Jared, and uh, Kate for uh, this afternoon's uh, debate on political extremism on the public lands. Uh, two things. Let me uh, remind you that uh, uh, March 14th and 15th, uh, the Stegner Center's 29th Annual Symposium on the Transition uh, to Renewable Energy, How to Build a Bright uh, Future. Uh, and on April 10th, over the noon hour, another Stegner Center green bag on Wallace Stegner's unsettled country, ruin, realism, and possibility in the American West. And I'll conclude with Fuglera, Federal Onshore Oil and Gas Leasing Reform Act of 1987. <laughs> Thank you for joining us.